No, I'm gonna I'm gonna cut my talk short. Don't worry. I'll try I'll try to get you to coffee, because um, I really need you to come back after coffee and hear our external speakers. And then we have got some fabulous stuff uh, ready for you over in the library when you have a chance to join some of the people in in the black t-shirts. And I'm so impressed that you're wearing black t-shirts. I think that's really cool. We could we could be Apple. Hey, we could be Apple. Here. <laughs> it's just so it's so cool. Okay, so. Um, so I'm going to keep some of this short, but I'm going to rattle through some of this. And I will answer, actually, your question, John, with a slightly different answer to, to, to Marx, because um, clearly the people who are wearing those T-shirts are wearing the sexiest knowledge media, actually. It's the T-shirts that are sexy. And Marx proved that by turning around on stage. That's way sexier than anything that we've done with technology. <laughs> the simplest of the technologies are actually the most important. And we do f sometimes forget that technology is, is everything that we use. It isn't computers. Um, and it is becoming more and more pervasive and immersive, and we are part of it. We are wearing some pretty cool technology. I hope you like this suit. It's pretty cool technology. Um, I'm not spending time on the, the old days, because you, you kind of heard a lot about that. But I did want to show you a picture of the original hut um, and point you, Teen Time writing there, to one of the original concept movies. I don't have time to play it, but the original concept movie showing some of the vision of what the world would, like in, in, t would look like in 10 years. And given that it was 20 years ago, um, you really need to see what uh, Mark and Tom and the team felt the world would look like in 20 years. I'll give you a hint. Um, nobody was touching any screens in that world. Everybody was carrying big remotes, because clearly you wanted to work with big remotes. But they had very simple buttons on them. So it was going to be a world with big remotes and simple buttons. But apart from that, actually, the video got pretty much everything right, which I think is really, really impressive. Um, and we filled that space and then flipped forward a few years. Uh, oh, actually, no, I uh, have to show the flag. I uh, wasn't entirely sure we'd get to see it. Definitely keen to show that flag. It is iconic, and I'm pleased that Tom has still got it, because it is something very important in, in the life of the laboratory. And all of those enthusiastic um, people through the years that have rolled through uh, and you can recognize some of the simple faces. And we will have a rolling promo of a lot of the old pictures and the old things that we've done um, with uh, enthusiastic and uh, creative things over those years. Even then, at the launch of the lab, you can see the virtual microscope. Um, one of our most treasured, and we come back to it again and again and again with the science faculty, and working very closely with partners uh, in this field. And Martin's question is absolutely right. This isn't just one institution. It's simply some enthusiastic, passionate people bringing together a team of brilliant people all across this campus and beyond. Um, and I think it's lovely to see the opening of the hut with the virtual microscope, with a lot of people on this campus will, will recognize. OK, um, I want to say a tiny bit about knowledge media. It's not, not going to be a real talk. So just to, I want to, what I want to do in this piece to get you to coffee and then through the rest of the afternoon is just show you a few fun things that flag up some of the fun things you can ask about in detail when you go over to the library and see some of the demos. You need to think a bit about the knowledge media topic, though. Um, knowledge media is a great transversal subject. It's not interdisciplinary. You can't really be a psychologist and work on knowledge media, I don't think. You have to immerse yourself in it and cross all of those disciplines. You have to be all of the things that um, Mark mentioned when you're bringing together this subject. It's genuinely transdisciplinary, and it's about bringing the world of data that we live in to knowledge somehow through a media set of processes. And actually, as you will see later on, those can even be a t-shirt. Um, yeah, I think also in terms of process, it's very important to try and think knowledge media. I think one of the things I would say to Peter Horrocks in, in um, in entering the university is, is really important that he tries to encourage his team to think about innovation as a genuinely disruptive thing. If innovation is not disruptive, it isn't innovation. It's something else. Innovation changes what you do. It causes you to think about what you want to do and then rethink it from a different perspective. And in rethinking it, you do something different. Thinking differently is a critical part of an approach to bringing computing technologies and a lot of other disciplines together. So spin right up to the current time, and you have to think a bit about how to make this work. It's not just about the things you're trying to do, it's how do you make it work. And 
any good research discipline, and certainly this one, has to reach into policy and have, have policy impact. If you don't change the world through people and policy, then it's not real um, uh, research. Very challenging thing to say to a lot of researchers in this room, but you have to change the world through people and policy. Um, and the way we implement uh, knowledge media research is it has to be, as Peter eloquently said, only slightly impossible. It was only slightly impossible to talk to someone live from a mountaintop. Yes, it was quite challenging, but only slightly impossible. Turns out, on the Matterhorn, you can get cell coverage. Right on the top. That's pretty cool. OK, you, you need a satellite phone if you're going to do lots, eh? And then Karsten's pyramid is kind of hard to get to, and Everest is a little tricky. But it's only slightly impossible, and it's definitely worth a go. Because if you get it working, you can have a lot of fun thinking about how to make it make it work and some of the things you break as challenges as Kennedy said once you've sorted that problem it makes a lot of other things possible so bring us bang up to date we have been working very hard on policy We've been very hard getting our, working very hard on getting ourselves in front of policy makers speaking to people who make the change happen when you've broken a problem open and you can see the inside of it and data is absolutely one of the things that we're going to be doing a lot of in the next 10 years You've also got to be able to reach back into your own institution and do some things that change lives. So even if you've got uh, research that is about um, augmenting reality with augmented reality glasses where there's an immersive world, an immersive world of data, and you're opposing that data into the things that you can see, and you're manipulating those things that you can see, those are complex technologies. They're far-flung, difficult, and probably a few years away. But even looking through your iPad on the first OU brochure that hits your mat this year, you can use a very simple application to take some elements of that augmented reality and bring it to life. Rosetta can float out of the page of an open university brochure, and being proud of our space science, it's a real piece of kit that you can play with. What you're not seeing in the demo is your finger touching it and playing with it. But if you download it from the store and look at the open university in a new light, it should kind of leap out at you, right? That's what the new technology allows you to do, and it's only slightly impossible. Sufficiently to you actually use it today if you want to. Now, I'm going to say a few more words in the remaining few minutes about research. So I'm going to spend very long on this sort of one, but you have to have real research impact. Research is the passion of every academic. And the heart of every, beating heart of every academic is a researcher who wants to understand the nature of the world and then convey that to a learner. Um, and bottling and, and uh, conveying that passion is, is one of the critical things we've tried to do. Now, I was going to run you through, perhaps, each of these themes. Um, but in fact, given the time, I'm going to pick one or two. And Mark has nicely trailed, I think, Stadium. So I think I'll, I'll probably start with Stadium. Um, we do. The things you will see when you go into the library will be about linking the data and the semantic. They'll be about live, online, social, and syndicated. That's my personal favorite. Um, it'll be about flowing data through, through new channels to new sorts of devices that give new affordances. Your, your next five years will become a wearable world. OK, might be 10. It's really impossible to tell when technologies hit the market, but we know that they will. It's just a matter of judging when it's, uh, when it's going to become market ready. Um, I only have one joke, and I will tell it now. <laughs> so be warned. Um, I have never built anything myself that has failed. Neither has any one of my team. We have never failed in anything that we do. We've just built an awful lot of things for which the world was not yet ready. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show, show some of those things. Just a couple. I'm going to pick a couple. This is um, The stadium is a dead easy project. We just picked stadium as one of our projects and, and the telepresence thread from which it comes simply because I, I spent a lot of time doing it. And as Mark said, some of those things were very, very sexy. It's very easy to say in every single year that we worked and I, I, I ran out of time to put images in. It's easy to find world-leading projects we did in every single year were working on telepresence. But well, the interesting thing about some of those world-leading projects that we did is lots of them didn't take, they didn't stay, they didn't last. They were things for which the world was actually not ready. Um, so some of them definitely did take and stay. Um, so uh, obviously there's uh, the far end, you've got Mark's um, 
uh, uh, virtual summer school and radio concepts working. You scroll through into the virtual pub quiz. We did a business school event for um, uh, IBM students trying to, to, to revise for a, a finance course. And what we did was we set it as a pub quiz. And in the pub quiz, there were rounds of the quiz and remote teams, team in uh, Asia, team in South America, team in uh, um, South Africa. Uh, the South Africans won, by the way. And what they won was we sent them some questions. Some real human markers answered the questions. They were very difficult to mark. They submitted their questions by working in a group. And then the, the clock was a pint of beer ticking down. And when the beer was gone, we had to refresh the round and give them some mark on a chalkboard. It absolutely worked pretty well, not, not too badly at all. But the students found it confusing and strange and weird and didn't get it at all. They were highly international. And the idea of a British pub quiz just didn't travel. <laughs> so it was a really cool idea that we were slapping ourselves on the back over. Some of the technology was rather clever, and we were patting ourselves on that as well. But it was an idea that their world was not ready for. Fortunately, there were enough English people in the South um, um, uh, Af African team to got the concept that they could keep up with what we were trying to do and manage to win the quiz. Um, so in terms of cool events, you can absolutely get it right and absolutely get it wrong. Even if the technology is absolutely right and brilliant, it doesn't mean it's going to work. Spin forward to Lyceum, um, which certainly was well in advance of moving into Illuminate and those sorts of things. We come to the virtual degree ceremony in 2000. So the first degree ceremony of the year 2000 was wholly virtual. It was conducted in this room to a remote audience that was somewhere in the world. People in a, well, probably the best story we had was you know, a woman in a, a cyber cafe in Ealing, right, was, was dialing in to this session to try and take part in her degree ceremony. Because many OU students can't come to Ely Cathedral and process and shake the Vice Chancellor's hand. And they want to celebrate the many years they've invested in this. So in that year, we persuaded um, degrees and ceremonies to work with us on this very simple thing. And we would run it, and they would just watch. And we gave a degree to Tim Berners-Lee. We dialed him in again. Spectacularly cool, very clever, really nice, good technologies. Second year, it was a success. We did it again. This time, degrees and ceremonies um, sat with us trying to understand how the technology mix worked. OK, so far so good. Again, huge success. We, the students had a portfolio. They called in answers to the questions. Um, we, we, get, we, we built a voicemail system. So I said, press 1 to answer question 1. Um, what was the most enjoyable experience of your degree? Question 2. Um, did you work really hard, and what are you doing next? All the students answered that in the voicemail thing. And when it came to shaking on the virtual stage, we played the voicemail messages back. Again, spectacularly cool. Sounded like they were there. Everyone was very happy. Huge rounds of applause. Well done. Third year, we let the degrees and ceremonies team run it entirely. And they ran, they ran the process. Again, huge success. Fantastic worked. Fourth year, we walked out of the room and got on with the rest of our work, and the event was cancelled because we had failed to take into account that nobody was particularly interested in those days in virtual degrees um, on our side. The students were quite interested in it, but we as a university, it was a bit too early. We weren't quite ready to be doing that. There were a whole bunch of reasons why it didn't quite fit with what the Open University saw itself doing at that time. And when the enthusiast technologists walk out the door, it gets cancelled and never happens again. And track on through to some of these other things. We've got some really cool technologies. Some of the technologies are successful, some of them are not. And it's really worth thinking a bit about what makes that successful mix of technologies. And whilst it is the case that the team here in black can make anything work, it's slightly impossible. Making it stick, making it stay, takes quite a lot of other thinking. There is that policy and people thing to take into account. Mark has already said, this is probably the thing I am most proud of in the work that I've done. This is a system that we invented 12 more years ago, 13, how many, how many, many years, Kevin. We've been working on the system, Kevin and John and the team, and it's still in use today. It's still in use today, and it's even in use in the Open University in little niches. It was adopted by um, one of the Open University teams in engineering, T8, I think, um, many years ago, and they're still using it. Um, and it, it allows you to have, before Skype, we needed something that did Skype, so we invented it. It also measures everything and collates everything. It lets you examine everything. That picture is from one of my research papers demonstrating that the woman in green is a perfect peer mentor. 
Um, you can look at the shapes of meetings, you can aggregate them together and look at the shapes of patterns of behaviors in meetings, and it is a lovely, we invented it as a data tool to do what we needed to do. And it's still in use today, and I'm very proud of it, and it'll die shortly, but it, you know, it did its job, and it keeps doing it for a little while. Um, very few things just to mention. This is one I'm proud of, and we killed this one, I'm afraid to say, Mark, we killed this one maybe two, three years ago now, because it had done its job and helped us to understand something. There's still nothing quite like it. I will make him ever so slightly louder. You don't want to hear this guy. The audio is pretty poor, because this is, but you can hear there's a dude there. He's Greek. He's speaking with a very thick accent, but you can kind of work out what he's saying. I'm going to make him quieter again. So what's happening is I'm in a meeting somewhere in the world, and I'm listening to a nice Greek gentleman explain the nature of uh, learning management systems. And he's explaining some of the key issues to this. And Mark and the rest of the team are back here. And you can see they're back here because they're all sitting, having virtual coffee with each other. Uh, you can see the front door of the laboratory. You can see it's raining outside on the front gate because there are cameras everywhere. You live in a world in, in, of immersive cameras everywhere. Um, so why not switch them all on? Why not connect them all together? Why not make them all live at the same time? Again, really cool technology. We liked it a lot. It allowed us to be in meetings and bring everybody into the meeting. But actually, the world kind of hates that sort of thing. Right? Again, it's an idea for which the world is not ready. I don't even know it's ready today, but I think it will be ready one day. I know it will be ready one day. Maybe it's not yet today. Because people value their privacy a lot, and they're very worried about the idea of having cameras on them all the time, unless they are like us, enthusiasts. Unless they are like us, keen to give away a lot of stuff in return for things like being there at a, at a switch of a button and getting the feel for the fact that there are all these other people around you um, doing cute things. Oh, and by the way, you don't have to point the camera at your face. You can point it at the doll on your, on your, uh, on your desktop or you can point it at your keyboard and so on. People manage these technologies in a very flexible way. Okay, running low on time. I just wanted to do, actually, I want to, I'm going to skip past this one. This is, uh, this is using the same technologies to get language learners to rate their, their language competence. Again, lovely deployed tool. Actually, this is still deployed. We still do have people rating their language competence by doing exercises, working with each other virtually, and then coding whether they're good, they're good at these aspects of language. This is the European standard for languages uh, accreditation. And they're trying to explain to each other how that mobile phone works, because that was the task that they were set. And they're being judged by their peers, who are also coding them, as well as the assessors. It's very cool, very nice, still deployed, kind of doing its job. Um, I just want to do one last thing. Bang up to date now. This is Nick in the lab with the latest variant of all those technologies. And this is a, so this is a success story. Some setbacks, some problems, some things that didn't deploy because the world was not yet ready, and then some really cool stuff happening. <laughs> so Nick is live in the lab. They're beautiful labs, they're just being refurbished, they've got lots of cameras in them, and at a flick of a switch, he can go live to absolutely anybody in the world. Now, it's not dial-up modems anymore, it's not limited to 10 people anymore. You can literally bring thousands of people to you at a flick of a switch, and fairly robustly have designed, at scale, complex interactions with them. In this case, measuring the decay of radioactive barium at a safe distance, with potentially thousands of other students just like you. Okay, there's only a couple of hundred in this room, but it could be thousands. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna do, am I gonna do one more? I haven't got any time to do one more, go on. Just let me do one more, I'll do one more, okay? I'm just gonna do one more out of my list of things to do and do the rest later. Um, as you all know, we've done a lot of media stuff and I'm really proud of some of the media stuff with it and I wanted to flag it. We've worked really well with teams across the university from science, LTS, IET, uh, open media unit, and they're all responsible for some of the work that we, we are seeing here. This in particular is a great collaboration with LTS in making iTunes U a fabulous channel when we launched in 2008, and bringing us with Apple into some really creative new product development thinking. We developed a, an ability to move all of the Open University's AV material out 
We had to build our own back end for that. It's called Podcast. It's used by the university every day, and nobody knows where it sits or what it does or how it works. And it's a very simple set of technology, but we needed it in 2008 to make all of this work. Obviously, a world of apps. We've been doing apps for a long time now. And I wanted to show the virtual microscope, again rearing its head as a cool thing we've constantly loved, which lets students see rocks in very different ways. And as Tom said, it's got great accessibility features. But even if you don't need the accessibility features, the ability to look through uh, the, your phone as if it was a microscope is a very cool thing to be able to do and allows you some remarkably interesting and unusual interactions with the wee slices of rock. OK, um, moving on to then pushing out new media beyond AV content to books. The OU does a lot of books. We have become a largely print university. Beware of that, people. We're not a publisher. But if you look at some of our books, they have some fabulous things in them. We design them very carefully. And they can be smart. We can start to do really smart things with our books that break out of the book boundary. This is one of the books for sale in the store um, that um, lets you tour the Galapagos Islands and gives you a, a, a slightly immersive experience in page. Um, and now, these days, again, our books can even do clever things. So you're on page six of a book, which students find very, very comforting. On page six, I know it's going to be followed by page seven. But even on page six, I can open out a widget inside the book, reach out here through to a complex simulation of a Cisco router sitting somewhere in the cloud. Thank you, MCT. Great piece of work there. And in getting to that Cisco router, I can run a complex simulation, get some data for myself, get some problems for myself, bring them back into my book, close the book, and I know page seven is next. Um, so yeah, you can make media resources, knowledge resources, with a little bit of thought. I will now skip to my last slide, because I promised Enrico I would do so. Sorry about that, people. This is my last slide. The only thing you need to do to make knowledge media happen is have a great team. And that's been said before. So thank you very much.